This is the Rolex Daytona 116520 released in 2000 and in production until 2016 where the ceramic bezel 116500 was released. This is the story of how I got offered it and how I kickstarted my journey down the watch collecting rabbit hole. My early years were largely uneventful. Apart from having lived here and here and here before the age of 16, my childhood was much like everyone else's and that included my interests. I wanted to play rugby, play video games and avoid school. I wanted a surfboard and because a Casio was all the rage, I wanted a Casio calculator watch. I would pestered my dad for what felt like an eternity for that calculator wrist watch. On a trip back from Japan, he bought this model. This was my growing up watch, the Apple watch of the 1980s. Growing up into a young man and moving out from home in the mid-90s, it was a time for a new watch. Again, the only real choice was a Japanese watch. Those Seiko people just made great watches and not stuffy, boring old man watches like the Swiss. The watch I landed on was the Seiko Arctura, my first mechanical and my first automatic watch. At the time, I didn't quite understand how that worked, but I did enjoy just swishing it around in my hand and hearing the rotor whir as it rotated. As far as I was concerned, this was a perpetual energy machine. There was just something about the rotor movement. I found myself staring at it all the time. There was just something about it that had piqued my interest in watches. In my mid-twenties, I was oblivious to most things. University was a question of doing the bare minimum, playing sports and getting drunk on the weekend, and generally not spending energy on the nuances and details of rotors, column wheels and hairsprings. Nevertheless, I had developed a habit of always entering watch stores whenever I was on vacation. Rome, Paris, Hong Kong, Jakarta, or even Alanya in Turkey had to find an AD, always. With my lack of deep understanding, the brands I gravitated towards were Rolex, Omega, and Tag Heuer, because they were prominent in The Economist and Time magazine that I read at the time, and it culminated in me getting a Tag Heuer with link bracelet, chronograph, and quartz movement while on one of those vacations. It looked good. But did I check that it was quartz? No, I actually didn't know it at the time. My mind was focused on brand and Omega and Rolex were just outside of my tax bracket. I hated quartz. Every year I would be surprised when that damp battery had to be replaced. I had to get a new watch at some point because I just hated the process of being surprised about that battery. I had to get a new watch and soon. Mechanical, ideally automatic. No more batteries for me. The choice for me was between the Omega Planet Ocean with an orange bezel or the Rolex Submariner with a green bezel, the Kermit. Didn't know that at the time. I just knew it as the one with the green bezel. At the time, I was living in the United States as an expat living in a San Francisco Pacific Heights apartment with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge. I was doing well career-wise and the money for a Rolex or Omega was there. Then, on a trip with the boys to Las Vegas, I walked into the biggest dealer I had ever seen inside the Bellagio Hotel. I walked up to the rep and I said, I want to look at this Omega with the orange bezel and this Rolex with the green bezel. Can I have a look? He took me over to one of those desks where they have that pad that they lay the watches on on top of the display case. He asked if I wanted something to drink, you know, water, wine, champagne. And of course I asked for a Coca-Cola. We sat down and took a look at the watch. The Omega, too big on my wrist and the orange bezel did nothing for my pasty pale complexion at the time. The Rolex though, I want to buy it, I said. Are you serious? He paused. He smiled. He politely informed me that there was a waiting list for the specific model and that most of those on the list were high rollers. It would be a long time before it became available and I wasn't going to get that watch. I remember thinking two things. What kind of a company doesn't make enough of their watches so people can actually buy them? I know. What do you have instead was the second thing I asked. I'm also not the only one that probably asked that question. I have this watch, he said, the Rolex Daytona. It's available and it's a very nice watch. Would you like to take a look? Well, okay, fine, I suppose. This wasn't the watch I'd set my mind on and getting offered the fallback option is never the best feeling. The Rolex Daytona is likely the most coveted watch in the entire Rolex lineup. The current 116500 commands a premium of up to ten dollars to $20,000 on the grain market. Wait times are well over five years unless you really know the AD well. It has a connection to the history of the first automatic chronograph movements, the whole Zenith Breitling tag thing that you can read up on. 
It was worn by Paul Newman, a watch that sold for around $17.8 million. The watch has been around in numerous iterations since its inception and precisely because of its longevity, its history and also the pure quality of the watch, it's actually really highly coveted for a good reason. And I was being offered this ultra iconic watch. The dealer let me know that a high roller had just turned down the model and I would have to make a decision straight away. So I took a long, hard look at the watch laid out on that little mat they always put over the glass display case. Steel bracelet, steel bezel, white dial, three sub-registers, screw down chrono pushes, blue sub-registers. Wait, what? There it was, in the display case under the Rolex, the Breitling. Now that was a gorgeous watch. Masculine, unlike the decidedly feminine, in my view, aesthetic of the Daytona. Tough, rugged, modern. I bought it then and there. The Daytona just didn't do it for me. I chose the Breitling entirely on face value over the Daytona, knowing absolutely nothing about Breitling's or Rolex's heritage. Back in San Francisco days later, I decided to go to a bookstore and buy a book about watches. I ended up buying, I don't know, five. I wanted to understand how movements worked. I was curious as to why Rolex was so sought after and also I just felt that I'd been in so many watch stores and a watch had always been a part of my attire. So I felt it was about time that I understood a little more about it. You idiot! Unsurprisingly, I quickly came to understand the mistake I'd made. The Daytona, a legendary watch, a coveted watch. The Breitling, that specific model had no history as such. It was just the watch I liked, but I found myself questioning what meant something to me about watches, because I wasn't oblivious to the fact that the Daytona would have been a more popular and wiser choice. This conundrum of the Breitling chosen and the Daytona ignored has shaped not only my watch journey, but my decision-making process about many things since then. I'm never going to be an ultimate movement buff. I've heard of Lemania movements, column wheels and cams. I know my ETAs from my JLC movements, but you will stump me on the intricacies of a movement any day of the week. Much like fine wines, I like a good wine, but I cannot find the time or inclination to discern one terroir from another in the notes of the same grape. I have huge respect for those that do, but it's not for me. Will you get me a bit drunk? Will you help me relax and make amusing conversation with people I like? That's the question I pose for the wine. I don't want the wine to come to me and say, Well, am I calm? Is it flinty? Is it sunny? I don't give a pig's ass, frankly. I also think history is hugely important. The story of Lamborghini building his first race car out of spite and competitiveness with Enzo Ferrari is fascinating, just as the heritage of a Comex diver appeals to my fanboyism of Jacques Cousteau in my childhood. Again, it's fascinating, but it's not what draws me to a watch. I'm also aware of what is popular, and I have a tendency to shy away from what everybody else wants. I can appreciate today why the Daytona is so popular. It's a very well-made and very aesthetically pleasing watch with a ton of heritage. I do, however, tend to shy away from hype. For me, what draws me to watches is the totality of a watch and the feeling it gives me. A Panerai makes me feel bold, outgoing, extroverted, active. A Bulgari Finissimo makes me feel refined, intellectual, unique. A Rolex Daydate? Well, if I ever have one, it will make me feel successful. A Nomos makes me feel fun, happy, chill. The watch I wear speaks to the seasons, my mood, and where I am or want to be emotionally. I have a power watch for important meetings, and I have a nice guy watch for other situations. My watch choice is informed by the movement, the heritage, the brand, but the choice is always emotional and always personal. Always. That's what the Breitling taught me. I hardly ever wear my Breitling anymore. It's too big and chunky for my tastes, but I'm never going to part with it. It has the most memories. It has the most significance in terms of my watch journey, but also in terms of the things I've experienced wearing that watch. There's an emotional attachment to it. Do I sometimes hit myself over the head for not getting the Daytona? No. Aesthetically, I appreciate it more than I did then. I could probably have made a pretty penny on it. My tastes have changed, but it still doesn't speak to me like a Speedmaster does, or a Zenith Chronomaster, or a Hanhart. Maybe it will someday. Until then, I have my Breitling. What makes you care about watches? What's your story? Comment below. Thanks for logging in. Hope you come back another time, like and subscribe. 
See you around.